morning, everyone, and welcome to our first chapel service for the academic year 2022 to 2023. So I know some of you had classes already um, this Monday. So I think it's good that we are here gathered, even if online, to worship together to start our school year. So before we uh, proceed to our chapel service, let me lead us in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we live up to you this chapel service. We continue to uh, uh, up, upheld uh, your servant who will preach the word and we continue to guide each and everyone here listening to obey your word, not only hear it, and help us, Father, to worship you in spirit and truth. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Before we proceed to the scripture reading, uh, let us uh, have a short um, worship song to prepare us for our chapel service. Make me a channel of your peace Where there is hatred, let me bring become uh, channels of peace just like our Lord Jesus Christ. Today our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 9 verse 35 to 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. May God bless the reading of his word. Today, our speaker... Uh, before I reveal his name, let me introduce him briefly. Uh, he was born, raised, and grew up in the Philippines, uh, and he spent his entire formative years in Grace Christian College. He took up manufacturing, engineering, and management from De La Salle University in Manila. Right after college, he heeded God's call for ministry and served for a decade as a youth pastor, college outreach minister, youth organization founder, church planter, senior pastor, pastoral trainer, Christian organization board member, 
and Bible School professor. He earned his Master of Sacred Theology and Doctor of Philosophy in New Testament Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas, USA. He and his family returned to the Philippines in 2019 to serve as Executive Director of the Institute for Biblical Linguistics Exploration, or iBible. Regional Supervisor of Chinese Christian Fellowship Philippines and adjunct faculty of several seminaries in the Philippines and Nepal. Last June 6, 2022, Neil was, uh, yeah, uh, well, I reveal his name. He was appointed by the Board of the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines as its new president. He started in his new role uh, on July 1, 2022, just a month ago. He and his wife are blessed to be married for 17 years, and they have two beautiful children, 15 years old and 12 years old. Our um, speaker for this morning, uh, it's not really a surprise, he's our new president, Dr. Neil T. And their family currently resides in the countryside of Cainta, Rizal, and they are enjoying the view of Metro Manila skyline. So without further ado, let's welcome our uh, new president, Dr. Neil. Pleasant good morning to everyone. I bring greetings to the beautiful campus of uh, Biblical Seminary of the Philippines. I want to greet all of you, especially our new students, our beloved faculty, the entire uh, BSOP community, our staff members, our faculty, and friends. Today, I want to share to you from God's Word. It's a, I count it a great blessing and privilege to be able to share to you from God's Word. And today, I'm going to share to you about an important question. Uh, later on, I'll share to you the video towards the end. But uh, I, I have a video I want to share to you towards the end. But, uh, you know, the question here is, what would Jesus do today? Way back in the 1990s, uh, as Charles Sheldon, uh, he wrote a book entitled, In His Step. In His Step, uh, what would Jesus do? And uh, as a result, at the time, uh, because of his book, What Would Jesus Do? It became a famous saying, or what we uh, can say, WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? But I'd like to add on to what uh, would Jesus do? I would say at the end, we should say, what would Jesus do today? This is a very important question that we need to ponder upon. And before we move on, shall we turn to the Lord in prayer? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for calling us as a seminary, Lord, to heed your call on what would Jesus do today? Thank you for bringing each one of us from different walks of life, from different churches, Lord, from different uh, uh, locations in the Philippines, and even some are, are from outside the Philippines, Lord, to come together to be part of your community, of the BSOP community. Lord, we pray that today as we listen to your word, that you would speak to our hearts. May you motivate us and challenge us to the question, what would Jesus do today? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today, I want to ask you another question. What would Jesus want you to do today? What would Jesus, what would Jesus want you to do today? I think there is an important element uh, with the word alignment. I'd like us to think of the word alignment, okay? What would Jesus do today? And what we ought to do today, there should be an alignment. Which means... If Jesus was here today, we should be the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we know the statement in James chapter 4, verse 17. The Word of God says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Well, there are several things we need to recognize from this passage. First and foremost, if you know that what you're doing is the wrong thing, if you know that what you're doing is sin, then stop doing it. If you are sinning against the Lord and you know it's the wrong thing, then stop doing it. Secondly, if you know that what you're doing is the right thing, then continue doing it. 
Because you know, it's the right thing. But James gives us the third element. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. And this is what we call the sin of omission. In other words, we know what's the right thing to do, but we don't do it. From God's perspective, we are sinning against him. Now, how do you know what's the right thing to do? I would say from our perspective today, we need to ask the question, what would Jesus do today? If he was here in this seminary, if he was part of our community, what would Jesus do? And what's the right thing to do for us? We should do what Jesus wants us to do. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, sheep without a shepherd. This statement comes from the Lord Jesus when he spoke in Matthew chapter 9, verses 34, 35 to 38. And here, uh, the, the most important statement I would say from here is that the sheep without a shepherd. Allow me to read to you a portion of scripture from the Net, Net Bible in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. The word of God says, Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were bewildered and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest ready fields. Today, I'm going to speak to you about sheep without a shepherd. What would Jesus do? Let's run through this passage together, and I'm going to use uh, ESV this time. We could see here in verse 35, and Jesus went through all the cities and villages. I'm sure if the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, he would be travel a traveler. He will travel through various cities and villages. What would he do? He would primarily be teaching. He would be teaching in various places and localities uh, there, when he was here, he was uh, he entered the Jewish synagogues, and as we know at that time, most of these Jewish synagogues are composed of uh, uh, non-believers of Jesus. So he entered the synagogues, he began to teach, and aside from teaching them God's word, we could see here that he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. He's a preacher. He's not just a traveler. He's not just a teacher but he is also a preacher. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. What kind of gospel did he preach? On the kingdom of God, that the rule of God uh, has, to, has come. The kingdom is at hand. And moving on, he said he healed every disease and every affliction. We could see that the Lord Jesus is concerned with the whole person. He is not just a traveler. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a preacher, but he's also a physician. He's a healer. He healed every disease and every affliction that was brought before him. Moving on in verse 36, the word of God says, when he saw the crowds, a while ago we see uh, the ministry of Jesus in various uh, ways and means, but here we could see the person of Jesus, who he is. When he saw the crowds, his eyes was looking at the crowds. You know, when he traveled, he, he looked individually at all the people that he ministered to. He considered everyone as valuable. We could see here, he saw the crowds and he revealed his heart, his heartbeat. We could see here, he had compassion for them. He understood what they're going through and he had, uh, he felt what, he, what they felt. He had compassion for them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless. They are living through life in a helpless manner. They are so stressed out. They are so harassed with everything that is happening in their lives. Sounds like the pandemic, right? Right now, all of us are helpless and harassed. And here we could see why he had compassion for them. Because the crowd was like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. That's a statement I want us to think about. What would Jesus do today? He would look at every person as a sheep without a shepherd. And the primary need here is that providing a shepherd for every sheep. Moving on in verse 37, then he said to his disciples, he turned to his disciples and he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers 
into his harvest field or into his harvest. We could see here, you look at the crowds, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And here we could see that indeed he saw the crowd as harvest. It's harvest season. He used an agricultural term to demonstrate that indeed they're ready for harvest. And the harvest is plentiful. And how, how, how did he reveal the plentiness or the numerous harvest that he needs to bring uh, into to God's barn? We could see here that indeed he looked at the crowds. He looked at all of them. All of them were like sheep without a shepherd. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples, I believe that he hopes that someday they will become a shepherd to the sheep. He said, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. So I'm going to run through this passage together in this time. Let's look at principles that we can learn from this passage. First, if there's one statement I'd like us to, to learn today is, let us do today what Jesus did before. Let us do today what Jesus did. And what would Jesus do today? What can he do in and through us? First and foremost, again, let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Here in verse 35, we could see here that Jesus reveals what we can do. Jesus reveals what we can do. You know, the word of God says Jesus went through all the cities and villages. He taught in the synagogues. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. He healed every disease and every affliction. These are things that we can do as well today. But the question that people might ask, can I teach like Jesus? Can I preach like Jesus? Can I heal like Jesus? Well, the word of God says, the Lord Jesus Christ himself promised in John chapter 14, verse 12. The word of God says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. And greater works than these he will do, will he do because I am going to the Father. This is a promise. If you truly believe in Jesus, we know the right thing, which is to do what he would do. And he can do in and through us what he can do if he was here on earth. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is everywhere. The Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God's throne in glory, but he's also here with us. And we are the hands and feet. Jesus reveals what we can do and what can we do. We could see here, letter A, that God can use us to teach like Jesus. Jesus went throughout all the cities, all the villages. And what did he do whenever he moved around? He taught in their synagogues. He taught in their synagogues. I'm sure that many of you here have uh, signed up or enrolled or become a student uh, of, uh, of uh, BSOP so that you can learn how to teach like Jesus. Yes, uh, we will provide you classes. We will provide you uh, various ways and means for you to learn how to teach like Jesus. But realize that the context of teaching, it's not just any kind of teaching. Because if you want to be a teacher, you don't have to come to BSOP to become a teacher. You can go study in any kind of uh, uh, institution, educational institution out there and become a teacher. But the context is, how can you teach among those who are sheep without a shepherd? It's not just an, an important uh, uh, task of teaching. Christ wants you to teach so that you can teach and be a shepherd teacher among those sheep without a shepherd. So God can use us to teach like Jesus. Um, I thank God that God has given me various uh, opportunities to learn uh, God's word, to be trained in various seminaries, uh, first in IGSL and then in DTS. And now I'm here as part of the BSOP community. And all throughout uh, the years uh, and decades that the Lord has uh, built in my life, God used various Bible teachers. God used uh, various professors of seminaries to be able to equip me and train me so that I can be a Bible teacher today. And my hope is that you would also have the same journey as I have went through. So God can use you to teach like Jesus. Secondly, God can use us or God can use you to preach like Jesus. The word of God says he did not just teach in the synagogues, but he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. 
He preached the gospel. The Apostle Paul said, preach the gospel in season and out of season. Last night, I was talking to my one of my mentors, and uh, he, he said to me that at one time in a large seminary in the United States, there was one of these professors uh, during this, uh, um, they have this, uh, um, you know, defense of, uh, of a uh, uh, PhD student who was trying to defend his dissertation. And, and uh, the president of that seminary asked this professor, do you believe in evangelism? And sad to say, he said, I don't believe in evangelism. And then they were all shocked. And one of the professors right there asked them, do you have children? Yes. Let me ask you, would you share the gospel to your children? And you know what he said? No, I won't. And this is a big shock to this uh, seminary professor, seminary president. You won't even preach the gospel to your own children? And thereby he was, he was terminated from that uh, seminary. But here we could see Jesus can use us to preach like Jesus. Um, one of the statements I heard from, from our board is that uh, we have become a seminary that no longer believes in evangelism. Well, I don't know. I am just new here. I don't know if this is true or not, but I hope that this would not be a reality in our midst because Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. Let us see, God can use us to heal like Jesus. He went through the cities and villages. He taught in the synagogues. He preached the gospel and he healed every disease and every affliction. Now, of course, we are conservative, right? We, we don't believe as what uh, other denominations believe about healing, right? Well, here we could see that the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, did not heal everyone when he was on earth. He only healed the ones that were brought to him, whatever disease. Uh, that was brought before him, whatever affliction they have, he healed them. But we have to realize that Jesus is concerned with the whole person. He's not just concerned with their knowledge. He's not just concerned with, with their, with their uh, emotional uh, uh, needs. He's concerned with their psychological needs. Uh, he's concerned with their physical needs. The entire being, that's the concern of Jesus. So he is a physician. He's the greatest physician that this world has ever seen and known. He was able to heal. God can use you to heal like Jesus. When the Lord brings you to a church, if there is a, uh, an opportunity for you to, to serve God, he wants you to use you to heal, not to break up, not to destroy his people. This is what we can do. So here we could see, that let us do today what Jesus did. So first we could learn here that Jesus, that God can use, that Jesus reveals what we can do. What can we do? Secondly, Jesus reveals what we may do. It's not enough to know what we can do. We can learn here in the seminary to become a, a good Bible teacher, a good preacher, someone that can heal broken hearts. But here we could see here that Jesus reveals what we may do. There's some potentialities that we can do. Jesus said when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Here we could see his personal character. You know, his, his heart. We could see his eyes. We could see, you know, his feet, uh, his concern. We could see here that Jesus reveals what we may do. So what may we do? Uh, here, the first thing we have we could see here is we may just look at the need. Well, for you to know the need, you have to first see and realize and recognize the need. Jesus saw the crowds. Jesus saw the crowds. I challenge you to take time uh, while, uh, while you're around the city when you're traveling. I challenge you not to just look at your cell phones. I challenge you not just to uh, you know, uh, look at up in the air or look at look at people. Look at people that these are real life people and these people uh, are people who are lost. But the problem is don't just stare at people. Don't just look at them, see them, that each of them has a need. Because if you end up looking and recognizing that there's a need and you do nothing, then nothing's going to happen as well. Secondly, we may just feel the need. He saw the crowds. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. He saw them. 
beyond their externalities. He saw what's in their hearts, that they were harassed. They're living harassed lives. They're living such helpless lives. But we could see here, he had compassion for them. This is one of the, um, I believe, the core values that I want to build here at BSOP. Uh, I used the acrostic C-H-R-I-S-T, six core values. And letter C begins with compassion for the lost. I wish that you come here to BSOP with your eyes out there, eyes in here. Don't just look at the books. Don't just spend so much time reading the books. Don't just bury yourselves in the books. There are people out there. And God wants you to learn to be like Jesus, to feel what Jesus felt, to see what Jesus sees, and have compassion for them. Last but not the least, we may just hope for a solution. What is the solution? Jesus saw the crowds. He had compassion for them. They were harassed and helpless. Why did he have compassion for them? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. There you have it, our title for today, for today. Sheep without a shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. You see, even if many seminaries of the world combine, uh, every year we may graduate such and such number of people. But what's the need? Here in the Philippines, we have about 110 million in population. How many belongs to the Christian or the evangelical uh, realms? I think we only have about 6 or 7%. Let's say 10%. 10 million or 11 million. Can you believe it? 99 million will face eternity without God. They're like sheep without a shepherd. You see, you may see that there's a need. You may feel the need. You may just hope for a solution, but will you do something about it? Let us do what today what Jesus did. Let us do today what Jesus did. The third thing, Jesus reveals what we must do. It's not just what we can do or what we may do. It is important for us to do what, what the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to do. What we must do. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the centrality of the message of Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. What must we do according to the Lord Jesus? First, he said, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. It says here, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. I hope that your prayer life will be enhanced here at PSOP. I remember going to the United States uh, in Dallas, uh, Texas. And uh, after one year of studying there, I, there was this Chinese church uh, in Dallas, Texas. Or, and they, they need a youth minister. And I said, I also need internship. So I'm going to come in and apply for an internship job or maybe an on-the-job training on the side uh, or field education for our case. And I said, I have tons of experience with youth ministry here in the Philippines. I think this is just easy for me to do. But when I began the ministry, when I found out, uh, you know, that, you know, the ABC or the American Born Chinese is so much different from me. You know, even my intonation, my accent uh, is coming from the Philippines and they, they laugh at me at my intonation and I don't know how to minister to them. What did the Lord do? He challenged me to go to my knees and pray. Go to my knees and pray for everyone. Pray for the youth. I've never prayed like I've prayed before. And some of you may, ne may never have studied the way you study here in BSOP. You know, tons and tons of homework and you need to pray for your professor to give you a good grade but i hope that you can develop here your prayer life uh, one thing i admire with uh, uh, bsop is we have a lot of alumni i, I remember growing up uh, many of the counselors uh, that are either on internship or on field education with bsop cared for me nurtured me and i said wow they have such a strong prayer life their spiritual life is such a blessing to me and I hope that this will happen in your journey here in BSOP. First, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. And the word of God says, the next is 
Wait for the Lord of the harvest. Wait for the Lord of the harvest. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. It is interesting that Jesus never told his disciples, you are the workers, you are the laborers. I hope that you will respond. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And the disciples were wondering, why not tell me? Now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a laborer. No, wait, he will call you. You have to respond to his call. He will be the one to send you out. But while you're here in BSOP, your job is to maintain a close relationship with the Lord, to seek God. Where is God calling you and leading you? So that he can eventually send you out into his harvest. Wait for the Lord of the harvest. The word of God said, says in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 to 31, even you shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You might say, wait a minute. What am I going to do? Just wait and sit and do nothing? The word of God says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. You know, as you study, you are waiting upon the Lord. You are depending on the Lord. I hope that when you go through your assignments, don't just treat it as extra work. I have so much things to do. I have no more time for free time. I have no more time to uh, to watch movies. Actually, my first uh, several years I was in in uh, in DTS. I never had a chance to turn on the TV except maybe during weekends or very rarely. I never go out to watch movies. I I really don't have time because tons and tons of work. But here. While you wait for the Lord, when you spend time with the Lord, treat every of your assignment as your devotion to the Lord. Seek God and let him strengthen you in the process of learning, in the process of being equipped. He will strengthen you. He will renew your strength. Uh, I, I, I have a friend in, in DTS who uh, is an American, Caucasian, and after two years of finishing an MA program in DTS, he told me it took him three years before he could pick up a book and open the book again. And I felt like, what a waste. You spend your time reading so much books to the point that, you know, you want to throw away all books you don't want to read anymore. You're so exhausted. You don't have the strength anymore to read. I hope that this would not happen to you. You're reading for the purpose of being renewed. Your, 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 your purpose here is that God will change you inside out. He will renew your strength. And you will be like eagles. You will be sent out there into the harvest field like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. So many uh, graduates of seminaries are running and they're weary. So many graduates of seminaries are walking and they're fainting. If you allow God to renew your strength, if he will be your strength, when he sends you out into the harvest field, you will run. You will mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. Wait for the Lord of the harvest. Last, last but not the least, work for the Lord of the harvest. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Indeed, the harvest is plentiful. Look at the crowds. Feel what they feel. Be the solution. Let God send you out. Work for the Lord of the harvest. Let us do today what Jesus did. Let us do today what Jesus did. Sheep without a shepherd. Before I end in prayer, um, I want to share to you that later on after my prayer, there will be a video that I want to share to you. It's about the harvest field uh, here in the Philippines. Uh, I'm part of this uh, organization outside BSOP called World Link Ministries Philippines. And uh, I hosted them several months ago, way back last March. And they, we went and brought them to different cities and, and villages here in the Philippines, in Metro Manila area and outskirts. And this is the product of uh, their ministry here in the Philippines, or their, what we call, they, they look and see what's the need in the Philippines. But let me pray for you in closing. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you so much because we believe in you. Lord, and you promised that greater works than what you did, we will do. Because you're going to the Father. You're sending your spirit to be our counselor, to be our guide, to empower us. Lord, to be your hands and feet in this world. 
Help us, Lord, not just to come in here to be a SOP with a heart just to, to be equipped, to, be, to learn something important so that we can become someone significant. But Lord, help us to come in here to meet with Jesus every day, every hour, every minute. Lord, to, to see what Jesus sees, to feel what Jesus feels, and to recognize the solution that Jesus gave for the sheep without a shepherd. Lord, may you be honored and glorified. Be magnified in our midst as we begin our seminary life here in VSOP. And some of us are journeying through. Some of us are almost ending this year. I pray, Father, that we would listen to your call. And may we respond to the call to go out there and be sent out into the harvest field. For your glory and honor, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's been a well-known fact that the Philippines is the only Christian nation in Asia. So if the Philippines is a Christian nation, there's no need, right? Statistics say that only about 6 to 7 percent of the Philippine population is made up of evangelical Christians. Let's say 10 percent. That would mean 11 million people out of 110 million are Christians. That leaves 99 million people who are not going to heaven. 99 million lost in hell. So, is there a need in the Philippines? Yes, there is a need. Close to 90% of the population of the Philippines would consider themselves to be Roman Catholic. So it would be safe to say that the Philippines is a predominantly Roman Catholic country. It's not just what I believe, but what we uh, have believed, what my ancestors have passed on. That's the huge challenge for, for Filipinos. Evangelism. Millions and millions need to be reached for the Lord. The younger generation are more open. There is this openness. I think the Lord is just opening up a huge generation that could be open to the gospel. From house to house and from street to street, we share, we deliver the message of God without fear. Accelerated church planting, multiplying churches. I think that the World Link Ministries uh, can be useful, especially the training that uh, this ministry will provide our ministers and pastors uh, to be able to uh, to do uh, the church planting activities uh, in a practical way. Obedience and compassion is really important for the service of the Lord, but, but I believe that um, education or properly being equipped is part of that obedience and compassion. It's not just we are born again, but we need also to study and to have knowledge. If we train them, we can see churches planted with strong, healthy pastors leading the way. You know, to be ignited to, to plant churches. Leadership training. There are six to 7,000 evangelical churches in the entire country of the Philippines. 90% of the pastors of these churches have little or no training or seminary background at all. I believe what uh, Wording will offer will be the one that will uh, really equip the the pastors and even uh, church planters here, here in our, especially in our place, because this is what we really need. These pastors are vulnerable because of their lack of solid biblical training. We're in the last days, <laughs> and we have to do more uh, for God, of course, and for God to work through us. So for an expatriate uh, coming here to start sharing the gospel and plant the church, it takes, it's going to take longer in the sense that he has to learn the language, learn to communicate, learn to find ways to understand the culture and adapt into the culture and uh, um, seek friendship with, with people. And I think it would take maybe three to four years to be able to, to uh, at least somehow make some progress in terms of church planting. Whereas a local, uh, someone who is uh, immersed in the community, speaks the language, instantly can go out there, communicate with anyone in the neighborhood. They know him, they've seen him, 
and you can just you know speak the gospel share the gospel to them for some two months they could easily plant a church of uh, uh, Filipinos in the neighborhood for doing this is the right idea of what we're, we're, we're supposed to be doing think about it if we train pastors to train more pastors then we can see a multiplication of Bible training centers for pastors and this can multiply evangelism accelerate church planting and bring revival to the country at the rate we're going if 10% get saved the good news is there will be only about a hundred million Filipinos going to hell does that touch your heart they're your brothers and sisters it's the love of God the love of Christ that compels us and it should if it's not doing that the Cubans say if you're a believer and you're not seeing other believers say there's something wrong with your Christianity they're pretty radical very biblical I'd say God is at work and you can play a major part you can pray you can give WorldLink is ready to partner with you. Evangelism. Millions can be reached for the Lord. Accelerated church planting. Multiplying churches. And leadership training. Bringing solid biblical training to pastors. Together, we can be a part of God's plan in the most exciting time of ministry in the Philippines. <laughs>